A warm welcome to this time of worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. My name is Mary Halverson. I'm one of the pastors at Grace University Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The church building sits in the heart of the University of Minnesota campus. And a warm, warm welcome to you all wherever you find yourselves on this day. A couple of announcements. First, I want to give a big thanks to our preachers this morning. Um, maybe once a year, uh, we have what we call Grace in the World Sunday. And this is our chance to lift up the vocations and ministries of our community out in the world. And Martin Luther would call this the priesthood of all believers. And so today we are focusing on medical personnel, healthcare workers, and we are grateful to Dr. Nancy Baker and nurse practitioner Laurie Fuhr for sharing their reflections with us. Thank you so much and for your ministry in the world. Also, as many of you know, Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday. We will have a pre-recorded worship service for you that you can um, access uh, in the morning or all day. And also we'll have a live Zoom worship at 7 p.m. And the instructions, I think, are in your bulletin. Also, the second semester of Grace University has begun or is beginning. Registration has begun, I should say. So please sign up for one or more of classes that interest you. We are so grateful for the gifts of our um, Grace community who are offering classes and for all of you who are taking them. So please make note of that. Also, there is one more uh, women's retreat for this, this um, year, and that will be on March 20th. Please sign up if you haven't, and there's no, there's no maximum sign up for that. Also, a new book study is starting, and we are using <coughs> Dirk Lang, who is a member here at Grace, and the family now moved to Geneva, Switzerland, where Dirk is working with Lutheran World Federation. He recently wrote a book about prayer and action, and we will be using that, that book for a study during Lent. Also, if you are wanting to donate food and personal items for our garden pantry, which is free for all, please bring it to church or call Jill or on Wednesdays, that's the best uh, day to bring those items. The pantry um, empties very quickly. So we are grateful for all your gifts and we need to keep filling that. Beginning in Lent, we'll also have another day-by-day -day project. And this time it's about um, grace stories to tell. You will be getting in the mail an Advent, uh, Advent, I'm sorry, a Lenten devotional based on the Gospel of Mark. And then our day-by-day -day emails will we'll be hearing the entire story of Mark's gospel bit by bit every day. And then we'll also be hearing the stories of Grace members. And we are grateful to Josh Campbell, who is our reader, and to Christy Anderson Herman, who has been, who has been recruiting and organizing our, um, our storytellers, and Jill for putting it all together. So I think that'll be a wonderful experience we will all share, share together day by day. So I think those are the announcements. Thank you to all who have made this worship experience possible and for all your gifts of music and video editing and reading and reflecting. So let us come and worship.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. God of heights and depths, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts and lives. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image, 
Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Lori Fewer, and I have been a member of Grace since 1995. At the time I joined Grace, I had been working as an oncology nurse at Abbott Northwestern for six years. I was also living with Grace members Karen Carlson and Bruce Gates and helped provide hospice care for Bruce during the last months of his illness with a brain tumor. Dan and Mary, as well as numerous Grace members, ministered, loved, and supported us through that time. I couldn't help but join this community of compassion and care after that experience. And now we move forward 26 years and I still work in oncology for the last 18 years as a nurse practitioner at Park Nicollet. I'm not sure one ever enters a profession of like oncology in their early 20s and anticipates it as a long career. It certainly can be a conversation stopper in many social settings to mention my vocation. But I love what I do. <clears throat> I get to sit face to face with people every day, even during a pandemic, who are in the midst of a vulnerable time. Many people are being treated for a cancer that will more than likely be cured. Others are seasoned treaters who may have years to live, yet always with treatment as a part of those years. And others are facing end of life decisions as they consider treatment options. And for each of these people, there are stories, life experiences, family members, and their unique stories, relationships, fears, and more. The science of cancer treatment has evolved and erupted over the 30 plus years that I've worked in oncology. Where there used to be one or two options, there are now numerous potential treatments with new potential side effects, with new potential ways to treat those side effects. People have so much to absorb as they not only face a diagnosis, but also the biology and technology and options to choose from. So much can get lost in the details. 30 years in a profession would make it sound as though I am confident and knowledgeable about what I do. But I must admit, I rarely have a clear and definite answer to many questions I am asked. And oh, how much I wish I could have answers for everything. And oh, how much the people I work with would love to hear a clear cut answer to their questions. Illness and big life changes are muddy and murky and continue to be such a mystery. Which treatment will work best and for how long? What comes next and after that and after that? Can I plan for this trip or that holiday or be, to be around for this wedding? How will I feel from this treatment and will I still be able to do all that I want? How do I tell my children or spouse or friends? The science and technology of cancer, though it has changed and evolved and advanced so much, has not been my biggest teacher over the last 30 years. My biggest teacher has been the patients and families I have been so blessed to work with. This week I have had several teachers, a 37 year old man with metastatic cancer, not responding well to treatment. He sits in the room with his pregnant wife. We talk about his treatment and symptoms but also focus on the deep sea fishing trip he is so excited to take in a couple of weeks. I leave his room reminded to focus on the moment, to acknowledge the hard reality and to also find joy, both together, not either or. An elderly gentleman with a strong mental desire to push ahead with treatment of very aggressive cancer, yet physically unable to tolerate more treatment. I leave his room thinking of the uncertainty of all that we don't know, and the mystery, how, when, why. A biannual visit with a woman my age treated for breast cancer when her now 16 and 18 year old daughters were nine and 11. We share parenting stories and I get to hear about her evolving singing career. I leave her room filled with joy and hope and I know how hard she worked to get to this point. Mary asked me to share a reflection on my ministry as a nurse practitioner. I realize as I've reflected on my years of doing this work that I feel ministered to as a nurse practitioner. These few stories are just a tiny fraction of the 30 years of people who have ministered to me. I am privileged to have this title and knowledge base 
that provides me with the opportunity to enter into people's lives and to learn from them, and ultimately to be, feel the connection we all share. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Please read Psalm 50 responsively. The Mighty One, God the Lord has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence, with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the rightness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. Good morning. I'm Nancy Baker. I'm a retired family physician and a retired hospice physician. My dad was also a family physician, and as a child, I was fortunate to be able to accompany him on house calls he made to families that lived in the small northwest Illinois rural community where we lived. Though always welcomed warmly, I was conscious that this was serious business. I sat quietly looking at pictures in books or at other items around the living room, while aware of the low muffled voices that came from a back bedroom. Families looked so relieved when we left, especially when dad said he'd check back later. From this early age, I realized how important house calls were for patients, their families, and members of the medical team. They provided extraordinary opportunity for me to experience hospitality, gratitude, trust, and connection. 25 years later, I started making my own house calls and brought with me my own medical bag. One of my first took, one of my first took place in Chicago when I visited one of my elderly patients who had been a former concert pianist. While she remained resting in the back bedroom of their small bungalow, her husband insisted that I join him for cake and a cup of coffee in the kitchen. Later, during her physical exam, she was more concerned about whether or not I'd enjoyed my treat than she was discussing the medication I wanted to start for her irregular heartbeat. What gracious hospitality they exhibited. A few years later, a medical resident and I visited a new mother and her baby, both of whom had been discharged from the hospital three days earlier after a cesarean section. Earlier that day, she called the office to say she was unable to keep her appointment. When Mike and I arrived, four young faces were pressed against the storm door of the duplex, making it difficult for us to open before we could enter the sparsely furnished one-bedroom apartment. We were welcomed warmly. We weighed the infant. We asked to check mom's healing incision. As we stepped into the bedroom, we were surprised to discover no beds, no dresser, no chairs. Instead, several mattresses lay on the floor with neat stacks of freshly laundered clothing for each child in each corner in the room. She was relieved to hear the baby had gained weight and that we could remove her sutures, but imagine her surprise when we said we would be able to help her find furniture. She then professed her deep gratitude for our kindness. For many years, I used to see patients in an outpatient clinic on St. Paul's East Side in a senior high-rise facility. When one of, whenever one of my patients failed to show for an appointment, it often meant they were too ill to come. To further assess, I would then visit them in their apartment. On several occasions, I found someone gravely ill. I urged them to go to the hospital and was told, I trust you, doc, but I'm not going. Do what you can for me here and I will. it'll be enough. If it's my time, it's my time and I'm okay with that. I was humbled by their trust in me. But by far some of the most meaningful house calls I did were with hospice patients and their families. At one time I visited folks in all of the seven Twin Cities metro county areas. Often a spouse, partner, child, or friend would be present. 
I made it a point to include as many of these as possible in my conversations of and examinations with their loved one. I wanted everyone to hear the same message and give them equal opportunity to ask me questions, to express their anger or fear, to share stories or talk about the unknown future. One visit was particularly memorable because after introducing myself, I learned that the new patient and his family had years ago lived in the town where I had grown up and been under dad's care. This connection seemed to create an immediate bond, making the difficult conversation that followed significantly easier. Connections are important. My faith has been an important part of my career in medicine. Hospitality, gratitude, trust, and connection are what a meaningful and faith-filled life is all about. My aim as physician was to embrace these values and minimize physical and emotional suffering. Sadly, Suffering is universal, it's multifactorial, but I believe we do not need to suffer alone. Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus is with us when we suffer. So too, friends, family, even strangers can provide comfort to us when we suffer. Finally, in my work as a physician, I tried to convey three messages to the patients for whom I cared. One, they are remarkable and their, their life has made a difference. Number two, I'm grateful to have met and cared for them. And number three, they will not be forgotten. Thank you so much. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Today's gospel comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The journey up the mountain necessitates a journey back down into the valley. But for a transfiguring moment, Jesus is revealed as the Holy One, the Son of God, not only a human walking the dusty roads with the disciples, healing, touching, and eating. Jesus is linked to Elijah and Moses, to the long line of courageous prophets and teachers. And on the mountaintop, his divine nature shines forth and it troubles the disciples. They are face to face with mystery, the inexplicable. And what does it mean? Peter, who is unable to be quiet in the face of awe, moves headlong into a building project. Let's memorialize, let's capture this moment, let's make sure it is cemented down. Change is coming. The disciples are on the threshold of a new leg of their journey, and it will move toward suffering and the cross. And what will this mean? When we don't want change, it is easy to hunker down into what we already know, whether it be systems, traditions, habits, or comforts. 
One writer suggests Peter wants to be sedentary and safe. I can certainly relate to this desire. If I can avoid the unknown, suffering and death, and a journey back down from this dazzling moment, clinging to that moment makes a lot of sense. The journey up the mountain necessitates a journey back down into the valley. But the descent is different. We, along with the disciples, bring the mystery we do not fully understand. We bring with us a glimpse and image of shining holiness. God goes with us on the way down and goes ahead of us. And the holy words from the cloud are for the disciples and us this time around, not for Jesus as they were at his baptism. These words are turned toward us. This is my beloved, my son, the beloved. Listen to him. We are all invited to be grace in the world, as Nancy and Lori shared with us this morning. All of us are on a journey that includes suffering and death, growth and resurrection, and shimmering glimpses of holiness along the way. Receive this blessing, written by Jan Richardson. Believe me, I know how tempting it is to remain inside this blessing, to linger where everything is dazzling and clear. We could build walls around this blessing, put a roof over it. We could bring in a table, chairs, have the most amazing meals. We could make a home. We could stay. But this blessing is built for leaving. This blessing is made for coming down the mountain. This blessing wants to be in motion, to travel with you as you, as you return to level ground. It will seem strange how quiet this blessing becomes when it returns to earth. It is not shy. It is not afraid. It simply knows how to bide its time to watch and wait, to discern and pray. Until the moment comes when it will reveal everything it knows, when it will shine forth with all it has seen, when it will dazzle with the unforgivable, unforgettable light you have carried all this way. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ.
Let us pray. It is a strange time of year, O God, as we linger between the seasons of Epiphany and Lent, between the joy of your appearing and the horror of your undoing at the hands of those who would not or could not embrace your invitation to a new life. Perhaps we, like Peter, James, and John, wait for your appearing in dazzling light and unmistakable clarity. In these difficult times, we pray for a glimpse of Jesus, who is the way through the mix and mess of this life. We sing. Our planet is fragile, and so is the life that claims it as home. We wonder how long we can simply take what we want with little regard for what it costs your creation. We wonder if the planet is crying out for relief in the floods that are really tears, the earthquakes that try to shake our consciousness, the gales that blow sighs too deep for words. Renew and restore a vision of care for your creation. Remind us to take what we need and no more. Encourage us in a counter-cultural faithfulness that is not about consumerism. Spur us with new insight and deeper understanding that we may live mindfully each day, conscious of the impact of what we do and what we fail to do, we sing. We pray for the people of the world whose names we will never know, those who bear the weight of earth's pain. We are in need of a glimpse of Jesus, who is the truth, the truth that love is stronger than hate. Peace is possible, and life can emerge even in the midst of devastation. We pray for that truth to be known we sing. We pray for health care providers, emergency responders, all who risk their own lives to care for others. We pray for the city of Buffalo, Minnesota, reeling from a horrific shooting. We pray for your healing presence where it is so needed, for those who are without homes, those who struggle to find work, those who cannot escape anxiety or depression. We pray for those among us facing illness and disease, for Chris, Jim, Ron, Karen, Sue, 
and for those who care for them. In the silence, we add the prayers of our hearts. We sing. We give thanks for the good news that unfolds in the world as people dream your dreams, follow your nudging, and seek you in the faces they meet each day. We give thanks for transfiguring moments and for all those who are quiet witness to your love. We give thanks for the community of grace, for its leaders and volunteers, members and guests that your transfiguring light would be glimpsed in our life together. We sing. Draw us to the rhythm of Lent as it unfolds in our midst, a sacred invitation to explore the corners of our souls. Open us to your light that we might see ourselves clearly with all our fears and faults and faith, with all our desires and dreams and duties. Help us, help us to see our journey as a place of your appearing as we come down the mountain and into the valleys of this world, setting one foot in front of the other, in your name and for your sake. Amen. Please join me in the blessing. Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is within us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. Let us go out in the name of the Trinity of love to serve and love. Amen. And go in peace, bear the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.